You hear a lot around the holiday season about joy and being jolly. Lots of cards say it, it's ingrained in our culture and language and the music we hear. Tis the season to be jolly. May the joy of the season be with us. Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah. Why do we say it so much at this time? And why do those who resist it are called Grinches? I'll admit, even I have a little bit of the Grinch in me at this time. I don't like the commercialization. Our economy talks about it like another notch in a dial on the economy, on how much is spent and how that affects our gross domestic product and the stock market evaluations of all the retailers. Still, I go out there and I try to buy gifts for my family. I think it's great for kids and, and surely we do not want to disappoint them. The look of joy and anticipation is fun and it's as fun for parents as it is for kids. Part of me dislikes the mayhem of everybody out there shopping. And yet I do go out and try to buy some things. I might even try to get ahead of the shopping curve and, and buy things early, only to forget that I bought them or where I hid them. I'm still trying to figure out a few things. Giving gifts is part of that joy of the season. Does not take much of a gift to do that. It really is the thought that counts. A friend of mine said that they exchange gifts of things that they really need, like underwear, socks, t-shirts. I thought that a little strange, to be honest. But hey, if it makes them happy, it's their thing. But it definitely eliminates shopping at Goodwill and Salvation Army. We tend to be more generous at this time with donations to charity and to each other. Gifts do not always have to be products. They can be uh, baked goods, food, or just goodwill. You've probably heard the stories uh, during World War I of the German and English troops stopping uh, in their trench fighting in the truce of 1914, sharing cigarettes and other things to eat or drink, kicking a soccer ball around, or at least something resembling a ball uh, on the front lines, only for the commanders to break it all up and get back to the business of war and killing after Christmas. Some say this is a myth and made up, but there were accounts in English newspapers with photos and eyewitness accounts from some of the soldiers. As the war got more serious in coming years, this sadly was never repeated. There is also a story during the Civil War uh, published after the war in the Harper's Weekly Christmas edition in 1886 about an encounter near Fredericksburg across the Rappahannock River between groups of Union and Confederate soldiers. If only uh, <clears throat> uh, during the Civil War, and this was in 1862, there were friendly exchanges, if only for a day, and an exchange of items via a small sailboat that was sent back and forth with salt pork and coffee from the Union side in exchange for tobacco and persimmons from the Confederate side. Both these truces during the Civil War and World War I were unofficial, and often the next day, they would be firing at each other again. It is somewhat of a mystery to me why these events take place in so seemingly out of character in a war, where enemies become friends even if only for a while. Or is the real mystery why these do not last longer. What is it about this time of year that makes us be genuinely human and compassionate like this, even in the most unlikely of places? This season is a time for celebration in many religions. The Christians have Christmas, of course, 
The Jews have Hanukkah, the Africans have Kwanzaa. There is the solstice, which while not popular in this time, was celebrated by the ancient pagans long before the modern religions. If there is a perfect time for worldwide celebration, this is the season. Before Jesus was born, the Europeans were celebrating the solstice and the return of the sun. The Scandinavians celebrated Yule on December 21st, where a large log was lit of fire, and they would feast for as long as the log burned, which, if they got one large enough, would last as long as 12 days. The Norse believed that each spark from the fire represented a new pig or a calf that would be born during the coming year. Throughout Europe, most cattle were slaughtered so that they would not have to be fed during the winter. It was the only time that there was a plentiful supply of fresh meat. It was also a time when the fermentation of beer would be complete and ready for drinking. Sounds like the ingredients for a party to me. The Germans honored, honored the god Odin during the midwinter, which was strange because they were also very terrified of him. They believed that he would take to the air and observe his people and decide who would prosper and who would perish. This kept them inside for most of the winter. Further south, Rome would celebrate the feast of Saturnalia, starting one week before solstice and continuing for one month. Saturn was the god of agriculture. At this time, the most important thing to do was to enjoy yourself with plenty to eat and drink. Slaves were freed for the month and treated as equals. Businesses and schools were closed. I'm not sure how anything got done during this time, but it was probably fun while it lasted. Also around the time of the winter solstice, the Romans observed Juvenalia, which was a feast honoring the children of Rome. In addition, members of the upper classes often celebrated the birthday of Mithra, the god of the unconquerable sun, on December 25th. It was believed that Mithra, an infant god, was born of a rock next to a sacred stream. For some Romans, Mithra's birthday was the most sacred day of the year. Early Christianity did not celebrate the birth of Jesus, only Easter. The actual birth of Jesus was unknown, but pundits like to point out the unlikelihood of shepherds being out with their flock in the winter. So it, they say it probably was springtime. Nevertheless, early in the fourth century, the feast of the nativity was adopted as a holiday on the same day as the birth of Mithra during the Saturnalia feast. Thus Christianity was being absorbed into the pagan traditions in a belief that it would become more popularized. By Middle Ages, Chris, Christmas had mostly replaced the pagan religions. It still could get raucous, however. After church on Christmas, they would celebrate with drinking and wild behavior, much like our fellowship hour. Just kidding. In an atmosphere similar to today's Mardi Gras, a student or a beggar would be crowned Lord of Misrule, and then with eager followers tagging along, they would march to the homes of the rich and demand their best food and drink. Those who did not comply were often the recipients of mischievous deeds. In this way, Christmas evolved into a time for the elite to repay their debt to society by giving to the poor. Christmas had a rough go of it in the 17th century England, when, <clears throat> excuse me.
Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans did away with the celebration altogether. Way too much fun going on, can't have that. The Puritans in America were even worse than those in England. Christmas in Boston was outlawed and those behaving merrily were fined five shillings. Then Charles I came to power in England and restored Christmas. But after the American Revolution, all things English were pretty much frowned upon, including Christmas, for many years into the 19th century. Christmas in America was not always so happy. Often there was social discontent around the time, and in New York, and New York even dispatched a police force to deal with the Christmas riot in 1828. The beginnings of our modern American Christmas celebrations can be traced to Washington Irving's The Sketchbook of, sketchbook of Joffrey Crayon, which was a series of short fictional stories of how Christmas was celebrated in an English manor house. Here, the squire would invite peasants into the manor for the holiday. This contrasted with what was happening in America with riots and police forces. But in Irving's mind, Christmas was to be a time of peace, goodwill, and a coming together of society with a mixture of other ancient traditions. None of this was from Irving's actual experience, however, and many historians believe Irving invented the tradition. Also, thanks to the Charles Dickens novel, A Christmas Carol, the idea that Christmas could be separated for good in a Victorian society also made a deep impression in America. So Christmas was being redeemed, so to speak, and it later became an official holiday in America after the Civil War in 1870. The origins of Santa Claus is another story dating back to Turkey at the beginning of the millennia, around 280 AD. A monk named St. Nicholas wandered the countryside, giving away all his wealth and possessions to the poor and sick. Kind of sounds like Buddha, too. Klaus, which is short for Nicholas, was adapted. So the name Santa Claus became popular. But it was not until an Episcopalian minister named Clement Clark Moore wrote a poem called An Account from a Visit from St. Nicholas, which started with the words, "'Twas the night before Christmas," and you know the rest. So Santa Claus emerged in that story as a jolly old man with a mystical flying sleigh and a bunch of magical reindeer led by the Santa Claus we know today. The ubiquitous image we see plastered all over the place of a jolly man in red with a white beard and a sack of toys was immortalized in 1881 when political cartoonist Thomas Nass drew what he imagined from Moore's poem to create the image of old Saint Nick. But I seem to have drifted somewhat in the history of the season. So back to my initial questions and the title of my sermon. Is this time celebrated in the spirit of joy or in the joy of spirit? Certainly, joy is not only relegated to this time, it is... No harm done. All right, minor. Can you hear me on Zoom? Somebody say yes. Yep, loud and clear. Okay, I'm going to assume we're we're good. All right. 
So the computer fell off the music stand, just in case you're wondering, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, where was I? Um, certainly joy is not only relegated to this time of the season. Joy can be had anytime, and it's not owned by any religion, religion either, despite what some may claim. In my mind, at least, joy is bliss. And sadly, bliss is only a temporary experience for us humans. On the other hand, spirit is nothing but bliss. All the time. Since as humans, we are mind and body, or spirit with a body, we have both. The trials and happiness that a body produces with the temporal bliss of our spirit, which pops out occasionally when the windows to our soul are open, as we laugh, when our guard is down, and when we're relaxed with family and friends. The spirit of joy is when the conditions for joy are more prevalent. Whether that is because our sun reverses its march toward oblivion, as celebrated by the solstice, whether it is a god of agriculture, granting us a good harvest, whether the oil in our candles will continue to burn longer than they were ever supposed to burn, or whether a baby was born as a master who would lead us toward love, light, and compassion, and reverse the social trends of the time. All these forces mingle and feed on each other during this time. It is a conjunction of events not necessarily combined to the examples here either. There is something for all of us to get into the spirit of joy if we want it. Spirit in essence is joy. And we have all that capability within us. Certainly joy is something that we can have any time of the year, but this is a time where the forces or whatever you want to call them come together to give us the opportunity to partake. As the picture on your bulletin suggests, you may smile out of joy, or you may smile and invite joy to enter. Whether we are in times of war or times of peace, joy is there, even if for a fleeting moment, when we least expect it. But maybe, just maybe, when we need it the most at the end of another grueling year. It is then that we need to be reminded that we are not just bodies, but also spirits yearning to express themselves and remind us of joy. I close with this from Barbara Holmes. She was president emerita of the United Theological Cemetery uh, seminary uh, of the Twin Cities, as she writes, <clears throat> we are not headed toward a single goal. We are on a pilgrimage toward the center of our hearts. It is in this place of pro powerful repose that joy unspeakable erupts when you least expect it, when the burden is greatest, when the hope is gone after bullets fly, it rises on the crest of impossibility. It sways to the rhythm of steadfast hearts and celebrates what we cannot. Happy solstice, happy Hanukkah. May your lamps dispel the darkness and may joy enter your hearts, however it gets there. Amen. Blessed be.